All right, let's get started. <clears throat> All right, people, let's go. All right, so prediction, control, probability, and sampling. So it's kind of like a whole bunch of little subjects. Uh, but first, some announcements. Uh, project one is due today. Uh, there are office hours in MCS near B52 um, uh, by at least uh, one of the course assistants. Uh, myself and Rohan might also show up. Uh, so if you need help, there is a little bit of time there. Um, the midterm is October 18th. Um, oh, actually, one more note about the project. The very last question on the project, I forgot to delete the answer. So the answer that is there is the correct one. So, I, you know, when I make the auto grader, I have to go make the, like, the whole, all the answers, right? Otherwise, it doesn't have anything to grade it again. Uh, so that one, magically, is still there. Uh, so y'all got one right. All right. So, um, if you have any trouble with it or whatever, uh, we'll essentially just knock it out of the equation. So even if you changed it, try to figure out what was what was going on, um, just don't worry about 16, we'll, we'll get rid of it. Um, so that was entertaining. Uh, and then let's see what else. Oh, so the midterm. So first of all, we don't have lecture next Tuesday. Um, we will have a midterm, I think it's the following Tuesday. Um, and it will be in this room. Um, and so that will be as awkward as humanly possible. Um, so when you come in, do try, if possible, to separate a little bit. Okay, so, you know, if, if you can get an empty seat between you, that'd be better. Uh, if you don't, I'm going to have to ask you if I see space, ask you to move. So uh, please try to, you know, separate out a little bit. Um, I know it's going to be largely impossible. Uh, so that's the first thing. Bring something to write with. Okay, I don't care if you use a pencil or a pen. Make sure it's dark enough that I can see it. Um, and actually what we're gonna do with it is we're actually gonna scan it in uh, to Gradescope and then actually grade it in Gradescope. So just make sure it's, it's gonna show up, you know? So, you know, no whatever number 36 pencils. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, and then there, so about ballparky, right? A third of it will be written and then like two thirds of it will be a Jupyter notebook. So make sure you have a laptop that is charged. Make sure you've spun up um, a uh, Jupyter notebook, uh, you know, in the in SCC uh, beforehand. Um, and I've had a number of people ask me if it's as hard as the project. Like, it's a very hard question to answer. It is. It is as hard as what I think you should be able to accomplish in the course of and um, whatever this class is, an hour and fifteen minutes. Um, so, you know, it's ballparky the size of a homework maybe, um, but it's very hard for me to judge. Uh, you know, uh, I've used, uh, you know, kind of variations on similar questions before. So I think you should all find it doable. The part that is on the computer, right, is because I can't really do much else. It's open web, right? So you can use whatever, you know, notes or stats or whatever you want to have. We should have a midterm review guide available to you, uh, hopefully by Monday or so. Um, but it might be, we might be as lucky as getting it out tomorrow. Um, so that should also help. Um, and so, but what I will caution you is that if you have to kind of look up in detail every answer, you will not have enough time to finish the midterm. So you do have to study, even though it's open. Um, it's more like you've got one thing you just can't get to stick in your head. That's the kind of thing you want to be looking up. You don't want to be looking up every single answer. All right, any questions? All right. Um, and then homework three was supposed to come out Tuesday, but it's actually going to come out tomorrow. Uh, and that will be uh, due whatever the following Thursday. You will have time in lab discussion tomorrow to work on it. There will not be an actual lab uh, component. It'll be kind of a Q&A section uh, and then also some time for working on that homework. Make sense? Okay, cool. All right, 
little quick review. Uh, so group or pivot, uh, when you want to group, basically the group is the kind of more expansive version, but harder to read. So you can group by multiple columns. You can, you know, you can kind of manipulate different things uh, much more flexibly. It'll aggregate all the values of all the other columns. Um, and a pivot table is kind of, in my mind, much more useful as a presentation tool than it is to generally speaking, do real analysis with, because it's, it's very limited. You can only have kind of, you know, uh, one, you know, two sets of variables involved um, that uh, kind of show you the aggregate value. Um, it, it is still useful, don't get me wrong, um, but the group tends to be something that you more commonly encounter, and then you kind of end up with a pivot table a lot of the time. Uh, another one, just kind of as review, uh, is joins. Um, so just keep in mind a join is just taking two tables and combining them together, but obviously you don't want them to misalign. So you have to pick a column between the two that will uh, actually line them up, right? So that you put the right data with the right thing so that it doesn't matter what the order of this rows are here and the orders of this rows are here, or to some extent, the number of copies of each row uh, so that you can combine them into a logical way, right? So super handy, um, you know, just keep it in mind. Like I said, a lot of people find it very confusing. I think it's one of those things where it looks much more complicated than it is. Um, so just keep in mind kind of your, your parent table or your root table um, is the first one. And then you're going to join it using whatever column name against your kind of child or, or subordinate table. Um, that is the other table, and then you tell it what column you want to match it with. Okay, so next we're going to talk about Sir Francis Galton. Does anybody know who this is? Okay, uh, often referred to as the father of eugenics, um, which if you know anything about eugenics is uh, generally uh, thought of as kind of a bad thing, um, which it usually is. Uh, some people like to spin his opinion on eugenics as positive eugenics, but basically the idea of eugenics is that if you, um, you know, if you encourage certain types of people to marry and have children, or at least just have children, um, then you can kind of uh, genetically modify the, the population, right? Just like you do with plants, right? We do with animals. Um, you can genetically modify the human race if you really wanted to. Um, and so the problem here is obviously lots of questions of racism, things like that come quickly to the front. Uh, and most of the eugenic movements that were kind of inspired by his thinking are mostly very negative, very racist or et cetera. Um, but his argument was that you can make a more positive human race. I'm really not defending it. I'm just trying to explain what he was trying to do. Um, so, but he was a true pioneer in making predictions. Uh, he also happened to be Charles Darwin's half cousin who also held some questionable beliefs as well. But um, you know, uh, from a scientist perspective, he brought a lot to the table in stats uh, in particular. Um, and what we're gonna talk about uh, with him is uh, using basically how, how we're gonna get to what I think is the fun stuff here, which is where, okay, yeah, we've looked at a bunch of data or whatever, but what we really want to do is be able to make predictions about the future based on that data. Uh, and so that's what we're going to start looking at more of. Um, and the first one is we're going to use something that he worked on. <laughs> and so hopefully you all got the lecture notebook. Uh, find the right window here. Um, one day I'll understand why every single Zoom window must be always on top all the time. Um, it's really annoying. Okay, you apparently won't scroll. All right, so the first thing we do is, actually, let me do the setup because I hadn't done it yet. Um, so we have this table of data that is the galton.csv, okay? And so what this has in the table is the height of the father, the height of the mother, the average of the two heights, the number of children they have, and then basically a numerical counter for which child, the gender of the child, and then the child's height as they, when they were, you know, when they finished growing, right? So, I don't know, 25, 30 years old, doesn't really matter. Point is, it's when they finish growing, but before, because a lot of adults, as you get older, right, start to shrink. So before that, um, they grab the height of the child. And this column is a little confusing in that um, it's just kind of trying to tie the same family together. 
So the four children that they had, they are these children. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's just a way to tie them together. Obviously, we don't want to have the names of these people, you know, or other identifying characteristics. So they're just using this technique to uh, both, you know, to kind of hide the identities, but still give you the information you want. Um, sometimes this is also referred to as flattening data. Uh, so, you know, you kind of have repeat data in here, um, but that's what you're, what you're doing, just to make it a little easier to consume. All right, so the first thing we're gonna look at is what we wanna do is like try to understand this data better. So the, let me just, sorry, let me just fix this window. Um, okay. So the first thing we wanna do is understand the data. One of the really useful techniques for that is not doing that, is to look at it with a histogram. So we're gonna look at the mid-parent height. And I'm gonna spell that, oh no, text parenthesis. Okay, and so as you might imagine, right, in this population of people, of there were about a thousand, not quite, um, the distribution of the heights is pretty uniform, right? Like as in, uh, it turns into what we'll talk about later of what you probably all have heard of, of a bell curve, right? So, you know, in the middle, is where the most people are, okay? And then you get outliers, right? You have very tall people and very short people. But so these are, of course, though, the averages of the parent's height. All right, so when we're still looking at the data and we're still trying to figure out kind of what might be interesting here is that we can look at, say, the child height, right? And so those are useful, right? So as we see the, there might be something interesting here, right? The child heights are right around the top of the, the bulk of them are kind of right around the bulk of the mid-parent height. So that might be interesting, but a, a lot more useful if we could look at them together, right? So what we can do is we can, my angle is particularly awkward today, um, is we can put them both on the same histogram And obviously this does not work very well if the data sets are wildly disparate, right? Both of these are in terms of inches. Um, and so they're, it's useful to kind of overlay them. Um, obviously if they were wildly different, it, it's, it, the usefulness drops off really fast. But as you can see, right, um, the clustering of the data seems to be in the same area, right? So we have a lot more of the mid-parent height than we do the children height in that cluster or right in the center. But we can see, still see that kind of in the center area here is where we're getting the bulk of our heights. Um, so another way we want to look at it is maybe using a scatter plot. Okay. So what we can do is look at the scatter of the two types of height. Oops. Okay, and so what we notice here, right, is that and this is how you look at a scatter plot, is that we kind of have a nice ball, right? Like, so we see a lot of kind of, you know, a lot of dots kind of in the center here, which means there's a lot of overlapping data. So that's really interesting because it probably means there's a relationship between these two things. Okay, so that's one, one of the reasons why I look at a scatter plot for that data to try to figure out where that relationship is. As you might imagine, if this was like a ring, it probably would be a less interesting or interesting differently, okay? Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at if we notice that kind of thing. All right, and now what we can do is we can start talking about how we might make some predictions. Um, so I'm actually just gonna cut and paste the line from up here so I don't type all that again. And drop that here. All right, so I'm going to use another feature of the plots, okay, that you, I don't think we'll really need, but might be useful, um, where I'm actually going to draw a line in the scatter plot, uh, like just kind of say, put a line here, okay, and I'll show you why. And so what we can see is that, <clears throat> sorry, um, what we can do is we can kind of take a slice out of our scatter plot right? 
and we can kind of say, okay, we're going to just limit the data we're looking at to let's say 67 and a half and 68 and a half and take an inch here and kind of look at this one set of data. Okay. And we can see there's a lot of clustering. Okay. It's obviously it's not perfect, but there is a lot of clustering where there does seem to be some sort of relationship between these two. So to kind of narrow the focus, we're going to look at that one little slice. And so what might be useful to try to get, if we wanted to make some kind of predictions, what might be a useful measure of the data that's in here that let's say we came along with another couple of parents, okay? They have a kid, the kid is two, and we wanna make a prediction about how old that, or how tall that kid will get. What do you think we might be able to do with this data to maybe make a prediction? Anybody else? All right, how about you? Yeah, we'll get there before that. <laughs> so just this one area. So if we know somebody is between 67 and a half inches tall and 68 and a half inches, or sorry, the, the average of the two parents, how tall is their kid going to be? Just that one little spot. Okay, do you know? Or are we going to say the same thing? Right, so let's let's try to let's try to give a, a specific number. What what might we use to get a specific number? Take the average. So what we can do is we can guess that for you know any kind of given spot in here, and this is obviously a little big, but we can kind of say, hey, the average in here of the child heights will probably tell us that if we have any random parents that are in that window, the average height will probably be what their child's height is. Does that make sense? as we can see from the rest of the graph and from the histograms. So to do that, and hopefully you uh, didn't look down below and see me, but uh, uh, so what we can do is we're gonna take, actually, let me, so then, so how do we pull out the data that is just the mid-parent heights for 67 and a half inches to 68 and a half inches tall? What should I put for my method here? If what I want to pull back is just those mid parent heights. Right. So we're going to use a where method here. And then we're going to say we have this fancy R object, and we can say between 67 and a half and 68 and a half. All right. And assuming I got my parent, my friends right, then I can try to take the average of what we're calling the nearby mean. Okay, so what we're going to say is there's a bunch of this data that's within that window. It's, we're going to call it nearby. Okay, so we often will look at things that are nearby to get an idea of what that actual result will be. So that's why we get this nearby here. Okay. And so what that is, is that actual number is 66 inches and a bit, right? And so 66 and a little bit less than a quarter inches. All right. So now what we can do is we can actually put that on the graph itself. And I think. Yeah, so I'm just copying that from above. Um, and then we're going to draw our two red lines. Okay. But now we want to actually put on the scatter plot that position. So we're going to say 68 just because it's in the right range. And then the new, the thing we just calculated, which is that nearby mean. Okay. And so now, I don't know how well you can see this, but so now we basically dropped a dot here. Okay. So if we have somebody who's 68 inches tall, or the average of the two parents is 68 inches tall. I need like an acronym for that or something. Too much to say. Um, we can predict, or we're going to guess that that kid will be 66 inches tall. All right. So that's kind of handy. So, but what if we wanted to do it for the rest of it? Well, this is where we get functions that come in handy. So we're going to make a new function. We're going to call it predict, and we're going to do the same thing as before. Okay, we're just going to say where the mid parent height is 
are between, now we have a rule here, right? Because we're only passing in one variable, right? So all we have is the height, okay? So what we wanna do is get the nearby or what are often referred to as nearby neighbors, okay? Um, and so, but we have a rule here. We're just saying, okay, we're gonna say nearby means a half inch less than a half inch more. So we're just gonna say H minus uh, one half and then H plus one half. And so that's gonna give us that same window, a nearby uh, value for the children. And now I have a method that will do a prediction for any, why is it not working? There we go. Come on. Oh, I was waiting for an output. So now we have a function that will do it for any arbitrary date. So we test it with our original one, right? And we still get a 66 and a quarter. But then we can try other numbers. We get like a 70 and we get a 73. So we have 67 and we get a 69, depending on the individual mid parent heights, right? So whichever height window we're looking for, this is going to give us a prediction of what the children's height will be. Okay. So now what if we want to make a table with that data, right? So we want to add that data to our table. So the first thing we want to do is make an array of those predictions. Okay, so what method would I use here to use or to get all those predictions uh, from all of the mid pair heights? Apply right on. All right. My high CPU usage is affecting the meeting quality. Let me just see if there's a reason for my high CPU. Usage really running nothing. Oh, there we go. All right. Hopefully that will die soon. Um, okay, so where was I? Um, so we're going to use apply to be able to get all of the predictions for all of the mid-parent heights, okay? So now in predicted height, we're gonna have an array of all those values after a couple seconds. And as you can see, and I'm not gonna bother to scroll, but you know, basically we plugged in each number and it walked through it and did a prediction for each one. So now we have a prediction for every one of those rows, right? So now we want to, Oh, we're going to attach it to the table, but I feel like I would have left more. Oh, yeah. So now we're going to attach it to the table. We pretty much know how to do this by just saying with column, right? And then we're just going to call it, you know, something appropriate, predicted, predicted, predicted height. And then we just pass that new array we just made, which was called predicted height. Okay, I'm not going to get tab completion. All right, so now I have a typo. Oh, no, it was under. Uh, this is why you name things consistently. <laughs> All right, so now I just added a new column. Now it's got all those predictions in it. And so that's kind of cool. So leading up to where you're going. All right. So now let me just make sure I wasn't supposed to do something else first. Nope. All right. So now I can make kind of like a line, right? Like from far away, it looks like a line, but it's actually a whole bunch of dots. Okay. So what we're going to talk about later, not so much today, but it, like we can run a line through here and we call that the best fit line so that we don't actually have to have the calculations later, right? We can then just have a line and for any arbitrary value on the bottom, we'll know where on the line it goes, right? And that'll tell us the child's height prediction. And we can obviously extend it then beyond our data set 
we can go to shorter people and taller people, assuming they exist. Okay. Now we're going to go back to the slides. Maybe. All right. So that's our first thing about prediction. I don't know why I'm going back to the slides, but I'm doing a show in another slide. Uh, all right. So we're going to go back, apparently. I thought I had one more, but uh, the picture's on the next slide. So. Um, So we'll go back to the prediction accuracy. Okay, so obviously we've now made some predictions, okay? But we care now, like how accurate are those predictions, right? Because it's not very useful if they're wildly inaccurate. So what we can do is we can actually calculate the accuracy of the prediction. Uh, does anybody have any ideas what I should? Uh, this one's stupid. Um, so we're just gonna subtract X minus Y, right? Because that is gonna give us the difference between the two values, right? So it's just a little method. All it does is a, a subtraction. But what's more interesting is we can actually use our apply function again, and we can get, oops, the difference is for all of our predicted heights. and our child heights. And so now we have an array of all the just differences in inches between what our predicted height and our child height of our real data, right? Okay, so this is important. We're not doing predictions on data we don't have any data for yet, right? This is all, all we're doing so far is we're trying to figure out a mechanism that we can do a prediction with. Now we're gonna see how accurate that prediction method is. And then maybe we can use it to predict something in the future, okay? So, just gonna add that column as another uh, column on the table. But now we can start to do histograms to start to see how our errors look. And so what we can see is that our errors look like they're pretty decent, right? In the sense that they're, you know, kind of mostly around zero, right? Um, you know, we have some outliers that are really wrong, okay, and some other outliers over here that are really wrong. But, you know, for the vast majority of it, it our prediction is pretty good compared to our existing data. Okay, so that means we feel a little more confident that if we use that same calculation on some data where we don't know the actual child height, we can make a le legitimate prediction. Okay, so now. Wait, let me just see. There's something else I was going to show. Oh, however, could it be better? Does anybody have any ideas about how? Oh, I kind of gave it away already. Uh, I wasn't supposed to scroll that far. But so obviously, when we're doing the mid parent height, okay, we're talking about a man and a woman, okay, who are the parents for the child. So the challenge is, right, is that women are on average shorter than men. So if you use the same calculation to predict the heights for the men and for the women, there's gonna be some error, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so what can we do to fix that? So I'm gonna show that real quick by doing a group in our histogram, which is kind of a handy feature. So we can see that our errors, right? shift right so it's mostly the yeah so you got this is where it gets i probably should have reversed the the difference calculation but um so the the men tend to be off by basically they're taller than the predicted height and the women are shorter than the predicted height right so that's that's kind of a handy feature that we can now visually see that what where our error idea or like our fix for the error um what its impact might be so how do we take the gender into account well we could change our prediction model to be something a little smarter okay so does anybody have any ideas on what i could change here to make this a little smarter and i don't know why i left this out because we did this already but i'll put it back in so think about that for a second what can we do
And there's a hint in the argument that could make our prediction a little bit smarter. Any ideas? Okay, but do what with the gender? Right, what I'm saying, yeah, but like how? So what should I do? Any ideas? Feel free. So, so yes, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it a little differently, which is that what I'm going to do is instead of using the general nearby, I'm going to scope it to a particular gender, okay? So that I can make predictions based on the prior data that I have, right? My existing data where I know their gender and I have the gender of the child. And so I can now make a prediction based on nearby or nearby neighbors, um, based on that gender. So in order to do that, I can just add in a where clause here and only select the ones that have the matching gender. If I can type it correctly. Oh, I'm missing a current here. Okay, so now I have a new function. And so now I should get different outputs for the same uh, uh, input value, right? And as you might imagine, right, the male side is actually going to skew higher than the female side. So, so you got to be careful with this, right? Because you know, assuming a gender distribution of 50%, which is probably reasonably close, I've just knocked out 50% of my data when I'm creating my prediction algorithm, right? So my, so I have to be careful that I have enough data that it can support losing half of it when I'm trying to figure out the prediction. Does that make sense? Right, because one of the things that's really important when we're doing these kinds of things is that we have enough data to be able to get to a reasonable prediction. And this is a common, common, common problem in our data science world, as well as um, making sure that the data is actually representative of the population, which is a future subject, but also I think very interesting. So uh, let's see, what do we wanna do now? Well, we wanna actually add that column to our table. By first, we're gonna get the, um, what's the result? We're gonna get the array. Um, and we're going to do predict smarter, and we're going to pass it the mid parent height. Ah. Oh my goodness. And oops. what else do I have to pass it here? What, what can I do here so that I can get that male female? Because now I need a second parameter, right? So what do I do? Yeah, so that's the nice thing about the apply function is that if I keep adding columns over there, it will replace, it'll put the data into the other arguments in the function. So if I add gender here, that's a string, right? Uh, I probably should have printed that, but you know, we're just gonna say, um, you know, I did the same thing twice. That's cool. So it's basically this line is this line, and then we just do a width column smart predicted height followed by smarter. Silver tab completion. Uh, predicted bytes. 
So, so it's going to take a second, right? Because now it's got to do a slightly more complicated calculation for every single row, right? But now we're going to get different values for different children in the same family, right? Assuming they have different genders. So now the question is, did that help? And I'll, I'll give something away. The reason I'm showing you this is because it does help. Um, so, but let's prove it by actually showing it. Um, so now we have to calculate our errors again, except we're gonna use this other, this new uh, input, but we're gonna use the same function we did before. Okay, and we're gonna give it, oops. Smart predicted height. And so now we have a table that we added that new column to. I didn't display it, but that's fine. But now we can look at the histogram of it. And that looks a lot better, right? So, so you, you know, you got to think about what you're looking at here, which is this is just the errors, right? So what we want them to do is get closer and closer to zero for all categories. Okay. So uh, that's why we're kind of showing it this way, but you know, the, I think when I first looked at this, right, I think of it as like, why isn't the gender still, you know, the female still more on the left and the male more on the right? Well, because what we're looking at here is error. So we want everything to kind of come together towards zero. Does that make sense? All right. So that's a very simple prediction mechanism. Uh, and I think to help wake you up, we have the next slide. Um, which uh, is, I, I need more cats in our uh, slides because they make people happy. Um, maybe I need some sort of band, I don't know. Um, and, uh, but then we go back to the demo and we're gonna talk about control statements. All right, so does anybody know what a control statement is? <laughs> All right, they're exactly what they sound like. They cause things, you're controlling where the execution of the program is going. So uh, we have a couple of different tools like this. We're gonna talk about uh, the if statement first. Okay, so the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna play a game. We're each gonna roll a die. If my number is bigger, then you pay me a dollar. If your number is bigger, I pay you a dollar. And if it's zero, then we're gonna uh, do nothing. Or if we're the same, we're going to do nothing. So what we want to do is we want to find a way to simulate two dice rolls and then compute how much money we win or lose based on the result and then do those things 10,000 times, okay? Because we want to see how it's going to work out, right? We want to know how, uh, you know, how often will I win? So if you, does everybody know how many sides are on a die? Okay. What's the plural of die? All right, so one die, many dice. All right, what are my, what are my language pet peeves? Um, okay, so conditional control statements, they kind of, uh, it, it, technically they're different, but we tend to use them kind of together. So control statements is really the overarching category and conditional statements is one type of a control statement. Um, so that's why you'll see conditional statement there. So how, do we calculate the outcome of one round, right? So let's just say for the sake of this step, we're only gonna try to say, okay, how do I know if I won? Okay, let's just calculate how I won. So what we do is if, oops, wrong language. Okay, and what I want you to notice is two things here when I do this. So if is the keyword, that's why I turned green. Okay, maybe three things. I don't know. Here's my test. Okay, so this is if this or that. That's what if does. Okay, so if this is true, okay, then we move on to the statement here. So the colon is important, just like it was in the def statement. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And then notice I tab in again, just like I do with the def statement. 
So that indicates that this is what happens after this, right? It's part of that statement. So if this was not true, it would just skip the following statement. That makes sense? Or basically, it would actually skip anything that's tabbed in like that. So I'm just going to return one, okay? And the way we're going to do this is we're going to say, to indicate, we have to come up with kind of a rule so we know what winning means and what losing means and what tie means, right? So we're just going to say, if I win because I get a dollar and that's why I care, um, we're going to return a one. But let's say we want to do, um, you know, if we want it to be even, it's going to return zero. And then if it's you one, that's a negative for me. So it's a negative one. Okay. So that's how we're going to do it. But for now, we're just going to use that one step just to show you what an if statement looks like. Um, and then so we can do one, right? If we pass in a four and a three, we're going to get a win uh, on my side. And we want to make sure that we also get a loss working correctly. And if you notice, I get no output. Right, because it skipped the return statement. Okay, so it's still going to return because the method always returns when it gets to the end, but it doesn't return any particular value. Okay, so that's obviously not quite what we want because, okay, we sort of have, we definitely have when I win, but we don't have, we, we don't know if it's a tie or you won. Right, so we need to make our, our function a little bit more sophisticated. So we, to do that, we can. Kind of chain these things together by doing your nope. See, it's as soon as I look over my shoulder that becomes a problem. Turn one, just like we had before. Now we're gonna have another keyword, okay? And this is often referred to as an elif, okay, because of how it looks, but really it's else if, okay. And I'll show you why in a second. Um, but so that means we're still, so now we've, we've gone here, right? And we didn't get this one because the role was not greater than that one. So we're going to test again. And so what we want to test here is, did you win? So we're going to say your role is greater than my role. Okay. And that way we're going to return, what did we say before? Negative one. Right, and then lastly, uh, actually, let's do another elif. Your role okay, and then we're going to return a zero in this case. Now, arguably, that's all the cases, right? But we could have one more case else. Oops. Okay, return. Okay, so we have three different constructs here, right? So we have the if, we have an else if, okay, or elif, depending on who you're talking to. Um, and then we also have an else. I think it's, it's probably obvious, but how do we get to the else case? Right, so nothing else matched. So we got all the way here. So that means that we're gonna go here, okay? So somebody probably passed in something that was non-numeric, right? And so that's why we're gonna return that they're crazy. Make sense? Okay, so if statements are super useful uh, and changing them is super useful. Um, you need to be careful though that it stays not terribly confusing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, I meant to point that out. Okay, this is a common mistake. Okay, typo, whatever. This pair of equal signs means is this equal to that versus a single equal sign, which is a, an assignment. Okay, and I don't remember if you remember last time at lecture, um, somebody had assigned um, uh, something to an actual function. Um, that is a very common error here. Okay. So just kind of keep that in mind. Double equals means it's a test, whereas a single equals is an assignment. And basically your whole, you know, kind of the whole compendium of kind of math tests are available, right? So 
you know, you can do an angle bracket, you can do an e equal angle bracket, right? So that would be less than or, or uh, greater than or equal to, um, things like that. Um, one kind of tip, which I think isn't always obvious, is um, equal sign goes first if you use like an angle bracket. So it's just, it usually leaves with an equal sign. Um, but yeah, so now we have a little function that we pass in any arbitrary values and we will get what we expect back. And that's cool. All right, so that's the if statement. Um, like I said, super useful. You'll, uh, you know, you'll be definitely using it on the midterm um, and probably in upcoming homeworks and stuff too. I just can't remember if they're in there yet or not. Um, but yeah. All right, so the next thing we wanna do commonly, and this is kind of a little bit of a sidebar before we get on to another um, control statement. Um, but so random selection. So in this case, we're gonna say we have an array of two states, right? Whether we have to sleep, whether we can sleep in or whether we have to wake up, okay? And so a lot of the time, when, especially when we're doing kind of data science stuff, um, we wanna be able to do a random choice, okay? So random, as I explained in like one of the first lectures, random is actually very, very difficult for humans to do. It's also very difficult for computers to do. Um, so we're gonna use a method called NP random um, because you writing it, like let's say you wanted to try to write a random generator is very difficult. And even if you did manage to write one at all, the likelihood that it's actually random is actually not very good, okay? So we try as much as possible. This is where kind of open source really comes in handy. We try as much as possible to use shared thought on trying to get things like randomness or cryptography or things like that because they're so difficult uh, to get correct. So we use NP random. We're gonna use a piece of NP random called choice. And we pass in the array, uh, if I spell it correctly. Oh, I really botched that, didn't I? All right. And so we should get a different value pretty much every time. Oops. We're not. We're never. Come on, this is lame. All right, we got we got wake up. Um, so I don't know, as far as my, you know, getting up for work, uh, I preferred what we were getting, but uh, we should be getting it, uh, you know, pretty much. How often? What do you think? How often should I get wake up or sleep in? Yeah, 50-50, right? Like half the time um, or 50% of the time we should get wake up and we should get sleep in. Why did we get a whole bunch of sleep ins in a row if that's true? Any ideas? Because it's random, right? So just because it's random doesn't mean that every time you run it, you will get the opposite. It actually means the opposite of that, right? It means you will get a random answer every time. If you do it enough times, you should get a 50% distribution, okay? So, all right. So let's kind of start thinking about how we can test that theory. Uh, so we could look at NP random choice has another feature where we can pass in the number of times to do it, okay? So what we could do is actually test for it. And so we can say, this is gonna be, let's move on to the next bit. So, we can down here. I'm just going to take this because it's the same. Oops, not quite that. All right. And we're going to assign the result or the, you know, that set of seven choices to this thing called morning week. Okay. So this, you know, so now, now we have this array. So what if we wanna know how many there are of each type? What do y'all think? How could we figure that out without doing anything super complicated? Any ideas? So it's probably hard to guess. 
But what we can do is say sum morning, nope, morning week equals, uh, I lost my place, wake up. And so now what that's gonna do, it's actually gonna apply this test for every element of the array and count each of those as a one. Okay, or or a zero, and the reason is is because this, uh, you know, so the test of wake up to wake up is what's called a Boolean operation, right? So it's either true or false, right? And a true is represented by one, and a false is represented by zero. So we kind of are cheating by making this Boolean result and then adding up the trues, okay? Because true is conveniently a one. So now we can just add all of those together or count them, depending on how we're going to talk about it. But we can use sum against it because we can kind of cheat and take advantage of the fact that this test, I know it's a little bit confusing because this is actually an array, right? Um, but that test for any individual element of the array will either be true or false. If it's a true, it's a one. So therefore it goes into it. But if it's a zero, it won't, right? So that way we can easily get to how many of them were which direction. Um, part of what throws me off talking about these is because my cheat sheet obviously has very different answers for all of the questions. Um, all right, so, and that will obviously work for both sides of it. Um, so what we can do is let's start talking about our dice game. And so the first thing we're gonna do is as we talked about earlier, right? Is that we're gonna make an array of six sides, okay? Um, however, our sides, there is no zero on a die normally, right? Um, and so we wanna go one through six. That makes sense? Okay, so we wanna make sure the die faces look great. Um, and then we know with our random choice technique, and I'm gonna cut and paste this um, in the interest of time. Now we have a little tool that will actually choose one side of the die at random. So now we can actually make our game using rolling dice, right? So I can say my roll np.random.choice die faces and then your roll And then lastly, I can return the result from earlier on by doing one round, which is the name of that method we built before. And then your role. Right? So now, assuming I type things correctly, which I did not, apparently. Oh. Uh, roll. Um, actually, it's kind of a good point, right? So uh, if you saw, I didn't get the error until I, I ran it here, right? So it doesn't really evaluate this until it tries to like work with it. So I did the assignment successfully. That doesn't necessarily mean the method works. Does that make sense? It just means that syntactically, you got it right. It's kind of like the greater check. You gave the right kind of answer. That doesn't mean the answer is right, okay? So same thing happened here. Um, and yeah, we should be able to get into it. Um, I'm gonna skip that because it's boring. Um, so what we can do now is we can use another function called a for loop, okay? All right, sorry, another uh, control statement called a for loop. And Let's see. So I can say for i in np dot range five, and then game outcomes equals np append game outcomes simulate one round. Okay, so what did I do here? So a for loop, okay, has a 
variable that it's going to assign whatever kind of step I'm on to. Okay. And then we're going to use this cheating thing called an in, which kind of, uh, it, it's a little bit of a cheat because I don't have to write out what the range of things is. I'm just going to say, when just make I every value of this array. Okay. So in other words, I is going to be, you know, in NP dot A range to five. Okay. So I'm going to get five loops through this for loop because I'm just saying for I this many times. Does that make sense? So this one is basically telling me how many times I'm going to go over it. All right. And then what I'm going to do for each time, I'm just going to run essentially our game outcomes function again and do the simulator one round so that we can see how we did for five attempts. A couple of things I'd point out, I have to have some place to put it, right? Because we were talking about scope a couple of lectures ago. Anything that's inside the scope here, so anything that's inside this for loop, which is indicated by the tab, is only going to be around inside the scope. So I have to pre-make the thing that I want to put the answers into. Otherwise, it's just going to disappear, right? Does that make sense? And actually, in this case, I think it might error, but maybe not. I'm not sure. Point being is that because of the scoping rules, the fact that this is in here means it will not exist outside of here if it's declared in here. Okay, so that is an ugly result. Um, so why? What did I do wrong? Let me try cutting and pasting my existing one and see if. I assume I have a typo in here somewhere, but I'm not seeing it. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah, that's much better. Okay, so uh, I don't know what the typo was, but something was in there that had a typo, probably a comma or a period or something. Um, so now I have an array of my wins and losses, okay? I am not thrilled with this result, right? Because I lost four out of five times because I got all these negative ones. That makes sense? All right. So the for loop just lets us do thing, do the same thing a whole mess of times, okay? And just keep in mind that that I is about, is a, available inside here. So if for some reason you want to count the number of times you're going through it or something like that, that this I will be equal to whatever stop we are in this side over here. Okay, but for the for a while yet we're probably not going to use that fact. Um, so now I'm just going to essentially do the same thing. So I'm just going to cut and paste this again, which actually is in my buffer already. Okay. Except this time, let's do it, I don't know, 10,000 times. Or 100,000 times. No, 10,000. All right. And so now I get an array with a whole mess of them, except it's just going to give us an ellipsis here to indicate that there's stuff that it didn't display. Okay. So it's exactly the same as this up here. I just changed the range to be, you know, 0 to 999. No, 9,999. Um, and now I can look at, well, how, how many did I get? I should have gotten 10,000. And now I can actually make a table with it, right? And I can see how often I won. But what I care about, right, is how much money I made. So I'm going to make a group and then a bar graph to indicate how often I won. And sadly, I won about the same amount of times as I lost. Okay, so in other words, we're it's a wash for the money at 10,000 attempts, which makes sense, right? Assuming the die is fair. Right, so, but all of this kind of leads up to when we want to do something a whole bunch of times, we have this for loop thing 
where we can, instead of like the sum trick I used before, we could also do a for loop to go across it and apply some individual methods, or we can do some if statements and check for things or whatever we want to do. The point is that I can go across a whole array or, you know, manufactured array like NT arrange um, and, and just do a thing over and over and over again. Okay. So that's why it's called a control statement, right? Because it doesn't let you continue until you've done that thing X number of times, or in this case, I number of times. Oops. All right, so let's see. So, All right, so kind of using the same idea, we're gonna talk about um, going to see that 50% problem another way, which is using a coin, right? So a coin, common, you know, just kind of slangy is heads and tails. Uh, you can actually, you know, you every coin actually has a head and a tail side. Um, it's just whether you just have to agree on what it is. Um, traditionally, it's because most coinage has a head, literally on one side, and something else on the back. Uh, okay, so if we have our outcomes, then we could do like random choice against it and we'll get a set of them back. So what if we do, oops, I was scrolling the wrong window, I think. Hold on. So what if we kind of jump right here and say, let's sum the result of NP random choice. Outcomes ten and then equals heads. Oops, forgot to run this one. Okay, oh look at that, it was 50%. But if we run it again, we'll probably get a different result, right? So we got it four times this time. So what we're seeing here, right, is that we're not getting 50%. It's probably not because the the coin is unfair. It's probably because we only ran it for 10 times, right? We need to do it on more like the scale of like 10,000 times to actually see that 50% distribution we expect. So to do that, we're going to um, create a little function that because we want to go so many times, it might be easier to kind of do them in bulk. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, just give me the sum result of NP random choice out, outcomes, except it's not countums, uh, 100. And when it equals heads. Okay. And so that should now give us a function that if we call it, it'll give us the result of running it a hundred times or running a hundred coin flips and just telling us how many of them were heads. And by extrapolation, we know how many of them were tails because there's no side landing coins today. Um, all right. So we have that little function. So now we're going to get a lot, a lot of results. Right? Because we're going to run for 10,000 times, we're going to run 100 coin flips. Okay? So now we have an array that's got a lot more results in it. And so we can now throw that in a table, right? And as you can see, right? So we have bigger numbers. And so because we're just getting those counts. So what we can do is we obviously don't want to try to figure out the, how to parse the 10,000 rows we have there. Um, so what if we did a histogram of the result? Okay. And that's exactly what we expect. So we're doing two different things here. What we're actually doing is we're not only testing our heads and tails, but really what we're saying is let's do a batch of tests and then do another batch of tests and then another batch of tests, because that way maybe the the individual batch might be thrown off somehow, but if we do enough batches, we should be able to get to a result that is like we expect. Okay, so this becomes very important later on when we're dealing with more complex things, but 
as you can see, most of our batches ended up where we expected them to. But at the same time, we do see outliers, right? We do see batches that were on either end of the spectrum because they, you know, and for whatever reason, on this particular set of 10,000 runs of 100 coin flips each, we didn't actually end up with any ones that were wildly skewed down. Okay. But we see that most of it took place where we expect it to be. So that's kind of the value here is we we're kind of like trying to control for randomness through kind of two different levels. We're do, first doing a batch, which does a whole bunch of things or a whole bunch of times just so that we can um, kind of start to control for some of that randomness. Then we're gonna actually do batches of batches, right? We're gonna do one big batch of the hundred batches. So that way we can even more control for randomness and we end up with a histogram that we expect, okay? If you might imagine, right? If I just ran that once, I probably won't get something that's so pretty, right? I, I'll get something, or I potentially can get something that's an outlier. And if the data is unknown, it's really important that we get something that is a true representation of the data because we don't have any way of knowing that it's wrong, right? Because if we, you know, if we did this whole thing, right, and the whole thing was skewed over here, we would say, I have a bug somewhere, right? Because we know it's supposed to be here. But if we don't know the data, we don't know where it's going to, 